All right. Um, I, I must preface this by saying that the, uh, the task I was given yesterday was to be uh, somewhat autobiographical and, uh, and tell a story that's uh, sort of me. And since I'm a visual anthropologist, I, I put the story into the pictures and I talk about leadership. So you all get to multitask here. And I know you're up to it because you just had like four cups of coffee. So we're good. Um, and I'm going to start with the notion of an emergent organization. And emergent organizations, as Joey Ito of the MIT Media Labs notes, are the future of science, commerce, innovation, and creativity. So as a future we all want to be in. Uh, if your organization is not emergent, uh, that could soon be an emergency. Um, the, the job of the emergent organization leader is threefold. To be more precise, leadership operates at three levels, and ESIP is a good example. Level one, leaders need to build an open and safe organization, right? This means that the whole organization is safe. No unsafe margins, no comfy center. ESIP belongs to all of its members. ESIP wants every member to participate and all participants to feel welcome and regarded. The goal is for the organization to become a congruent organization, very much in the Carl Rogers sense of a congruent person. So that's level one. Level two, leaders promote positive, trustful teamwork. This is how ESIP clusters get things done. Earth science requires teams, collectives that share their expertise to solve common problems, right? You're not going to solve problems on your own. You need to find that team, and ESIP is where you find that team. Level three, leaders encourage and support. They do this by helping the organization become a learning and listening organization. And in a part no less important, they do this by working on themselves. Let me step back. What is an emergent organization and how does this concept fit with science? First off, science has long been emergent. It works at the slippery boundary between knowledge and ignorance. Still, the role of creativity and innovation in science needs to be further explored and understood. I mean, there are whole books about science being serendipitous. And what's more emergent than serendipity? And how do you lead an organization that's looking to sustain serendipity? One of the main advantages of emergent organizations is an ability to take more risk and to benefit from risk, to surf the edges of the possible, and to fail and recover rapidly. Emergent organizations are learning organizations. They present a lot of problems for the leaders because of this. And the tendency is to fall back into command and control, to build that five-year plan and just stick to it. The best leaders build the organizations that expresses the desires and enables the potentials of its members, its employees, or its volunteers. Leaders do not draw the map. They distribute the compasses, and they build the orienteering course that get their teams up to speed. Now, stepping back even further, since 1976, I've been looking at intentional culture, at events and organizations that do cultural practices which are planned and studied and maintained and celebrated. The intentional cultural activities I've been studying fall into three buckets. Festivals, games, and spectacles. Often the spectacles, such as the Disneyland Main Street Parade, mimic the festive types. And a lot of festivals have internalized games. The main difference between the festival and the spectacle is that the festival is intrinsically open, open-ended, and so it's risky. And spectacle practices are pre-planned and performed to a script. They're managed, there's a map and a path, and the leaders are all at the front. Festivals are the limit on emergent organizations. Once a festival starts, anything can happen, and it often does. Now, games fall in between these two. Game spaces are rule-governed but still open-ended. You, you cannot know who will win. The end result must emerge from the play, and the play combines skill and trust. The players need to trust each other. You can also say that festival play is the highest trust event, and the residue of this is an increase in interpersonal trust across the entire community. Now, you can really look at all social activities along this continuum from spectacle to game to festival. So where does ESIP fall in this continuum, and where should it be? And how about the organization where you work? I mean, these are questions I ask myself a lot, usually after a gin and tonic, but right now I want to talk about safety. Now, the logic of a festival, curiously enough, is to encourage risky behavior, but to do so in an envelope of safety, a zone of trust. Let me say that again. The purpose of a safe boundary is to enable risky behavior within. And inside that boundary, everything can happen in the open because while everyone is, walking, is, is looking, 
Nobody's watching. The logic of the festival is to create an open space where everything is visible, but nobody's taking notes. What is public can also be private, even intimate. Vulnerability is on display, and open vulnerability is where trust is born. Simon Sinek says that a successful leadership creates a safe boundary around an entire organization in order to promote the full expression of each member as a complete individual person. In their just published book, Whitlash, Joey Ito and Jeff Howe note the following, quote, organizations that allow their employees to pursue risk also encourage greater creativity. This is essentially where the emergent organization becomes a launching pad for new science. The leader's job then is to help set the stage for risky behavior in two ways. First, by participating, and second, by rewarding risky behavior when this happens. So what does risky behavior look like in the context of earth science? I mean, we're not getting naked and porting fire here, although we might. Uh, who's up for Burning Man 2018? Anyone? I want to, okay, we'll talk, well, the Burning Man cluster, okay. Um, so what we are doing is sharing. We share our ideas, our problems, our pain points, our laughter, and little bits of ourselves. Oh yes, and our data, and our learning, and maybe even our lack of knowledge. Isaac Asimov was asked once to explain creativity. He considered creativity in a group setting to be really, really difficult, but also integral to innovation. When it comes to group dynamics, he noted, the real problem is to encourage sharing, even when this may make one sound foolish. Quote, but how to persuade creative people to do so? First and foremost, there must be ease, relaxation, a general sense of permissiveness. The world in general disapproves of creativity, and to be creative in public is particularly bad. To speculate in public is rather worrisome. Individuals, therefore, must have the feeling that others won't object. If a single individual present is unsympathetic to the foolishness that would be bound to go on in such a session, others would freeze. The unsympathetic individual may be a gold mine of information, but the harm he does will more than compensate for that. It seems necessary to me then that all people at the session be willing to sound foolish and listen to others sound foolish. And this sounds a lot like ESIP. The ability to exchange unfiltered criticism in an academic setting is a lot like passing a fiery torch from hand to hand. This is how teamwork gets done. This is the goal we want to have for our ESIP clusters. There's nothing in the career of a neuroscientist more risky than being vulnerable in this way. I mean, there are a lot of weird field work experiences. Yeah, we all, we know that, but uh, nothing more rewarding than having a place to be so open among friends. And ESIP wants to be that place. However, ESIP is only as risky and safe as each of its members is capable of sharing. And this, at last, is the kicker. This is the essence of leadership in an emergent organization. Are you ready? Every person who steps into a festival space is a leader. Everybody leads. There are no followers. Isaac Asimov is right. The risk needs to be shared by all. The safe space is built by the actions of all. And it's vulnerable to bad behaviors of the single individual. Nobody is more a leader than anyone else. Every ESIP member is a CEO of ESIP. So every member needs to get their shit together. Now I'm quoting Brene Brown here, right? So um, if you're lucky, you might find a safe, risky place in a personal relationship you have. If you're exceptionally lucky, you might join an organization like ESIP where participants singly and together have crafted a space like this for you to work in. Everyone in this room needs to be a leader in ESIP. ESIP is a place where you can come and find a team to work with, a team that wants everyone to succeed. But you need to step up. I need to step up. We all do. It's up to each of us to build a platform that we can all step up upon together. If you're looking for a leader in ESIP, the first place to look is in the mirror. Let me end this with a quote from Brene Brown. She says, the biggest barrier to effective teams is not professional development. It is personal development. And to put it in the most blundest terms I can, people do not take care of their shit. People are not doing their own work on what it is that gets in the way of them fully showing up as the kind of people we need in teams and the kind of leaders we need. It is what makes or breaks a team, and it's what makes or breaks culture or leaders is how well do you know yourself?
and how willing are you to show up vulnerably in a relationship with other people to learn, listen, and grow. Together, we can lead ESIP to build a safe space of emergent creativity to help save and protect planet Earth. Thank you.